think it's a time where there's a new age spirituality has become very famous. And a lot of the traditional, I would say most faith traditions are a bit, you know, they're, they're a bit old story. Um, but then the people are saying, a lot of scholars are saying that postmodernism is not, is sort of dead as well. So what do you think is the future of uh, faith uh, and religions in our you know, 21st century? After postmodernism is gone and this new age religion phase is sort of in the ground. Most of us think that, that religion, in a way, has become the scapegoat. That, um, that that basic thing of conflict is always is still there, and that we need religion to to keep the peace, in a sense. That people blame religion for the source of conflict, but but that's why the need for dialogue, interfaith dialogue, is important, so that we can you know, come to. to to a deeper understanding of, of God. One of the lessons from postmodernism, which we sort of have to learn, is that basically the idea of pluralism uh, and to learn to live with that. You know, it's one of the good things from postmodernism. Uh, and the other thing I think is, is also that it's very uncertain and we don't know if there is going to be a future. And I don't think we can take that for granted at all. So whatever we do, we've got to try to work to try to make that happen. Um, I, I think that religion is responsible for the very worst and the very best in humanity in, in many respects. As a Jewish educator, I'm most interested in trying to teach metaphoric thought. That's why I was so interested in you speaking about symbols. Because um, in, in the Torah, I'll just tell you quickly, the Torah is written without any vowels. So the word could be wind or wand or wound or, we don't know really. It can have sometimes interchangeable consonants, so it could be lend or mend or wind or fend as well. And then the word itself has a different shorish, a different root, many different roots that all inform that word to its meaning. So there's no such thing as a noun in the Torah, they're concepts, they're all ever growing, ever conceptual ideas, every word. And then I could go on to say that every letter has a number, and the number has an energy in that too. And then the word itself has a combined number, which is the, uh, which is the Kabbalistic way of looking at it. And then in between the letters, there are questions that are asked that are answered by a story called Midrash. And the Midrash is also very important to the understanding of the Torah. So in the end, we, it, it is focused really on not being, not being literal, and trying to be poetic, always poetic. I'm sure, I think the Quran is exactly the same. Um, and for me, the savior of religion is in the metaphoric thought, in the non, the, the fight against ritualism. If I make three quick points there. Firstly, um, I think in, when we look at human history, a lot of religions came and gone, uh, fads came and gone. When you look at new age spiritualities, some of them are just all things packaged new. Uh, so most of them will come and go, uh, I, I, would, I feel. Uh, secondly, uh, I really think the only faith traditions who can survive the postmodern era and maybe into the future are the ones who can combine unity of God, oneness of God, and oneness of humanity. These are universal teachings, and I feel that uh, uh, in the intent of God, humanity, uh, we need to arrive at that point. And, uh, and thirdly, uh, the, the era of having uh, uniform societies is over in, in religious terms. You know, we will live in an ecosystem of religions in the future where uh, all faith, ideas, and religions will exist in a, any given society and they will be given and take between them. Mother Teresa was asked by a very wealthy lady, she'd been very successful and, um, in her work, and she said she wanted to find the purpose of life. So she approached Mother Teresa and she said, Mother Teresa, I want to learn what the purpose of life is. How can I help you? And Mother Teresa's response was, find your own Calcutta. <laughs> Which I thought was very insightful because she was trying to find her purpose by joining somebody else's purpose. Mm. The very um, quick another story. Mahatma Gandhi was was surrounded by many people one day. He was catching a train, and his one of his slippers fell off. 
and it fell onto the ground. And the train was moving. He immediately took, he immediately took the other slipper and he said, and he threw it on the ground where there was a pair now. And the train was moving away and all his minders said to him, Mahatma Gandhi, why did you do that? You, you've lost two slippers instead of one. And he said, well, when the poor man walking along the road finds a slipper, he'll actually find a pair, not just one. <laughs> so my question to you all is, you've talked about a collective issue of faith. What binds us all? Whether you have a faith or don't have a faith, we all have a philosophy of life to live together. And that's the global mission, I guess. And then there's the individual mission about what is my purpose in life? Um, Alfred North Whitehead, one of the greatest philosophers, talks about an intrinsic value and an extrinsic value of life. My question to you is, as we progress down this century, we are hitting some very major milestones, whether it's climate change, whether it's the way we work for organisations, the long hours that we work, the quality of life that we live. Where, is, where are we going together? Where does our faith um, lead us to? And my second point to the question is, how do you arrive, or at least how do you judge a person's journey, because there are six and a half billion people on this planet, each one has an individual <coughs> journey. How do you bring those together? Two if I may take that, if you mind, uh, well, there's a verse in Quran, chapter 49, verse 13, it says, O humanity, we have created you from a single male and a female, then split you into nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. Uh, the key lies there. Di uh, most of the conflict on earth is stems from difference. If we can change our paradigm, that difference is there for us to get to know one another, then uh, the world can be a better place. Uh, so <coughs> we need to do more of this everywhere on the globe. And the only, the only way we can address uh, the global problems is by everyone working in the same direction, same vision, shared vision. Uh, and I, I really think that we must have a, a whole new global civilization emerging with totally new paradigms, current capitalistic uh, consumerism is destroying the planet. <coughs> we need to change everything. Can I just answer? I'll tell you what comes to my mind when you ask that question. It's completely unrelated to anything Jewish or anything. It's just, this is the image I have as you speak. I have a very close friend whose husband is dying at the moment. I said to her, how are you going? She said to me, this is the most precious time I've ever known. We look into each other's eyes and nothing exists except love. And she's not frightened. Death has been transcended. Fear has been transcended. Loss, nothing exists but the love. It, felt, it feels to me that this must be the highest human achievement to transcend this world through love of all things. It feels like their love will elevate the world and somehow emanate out to us all. That's how it feels to me. And I saw people worshipping, worshipping Buddha as a god. And it's, it's a bit striking to me because I've always known Buddhists as a, a non-transcendental a non -transcendental religion in this respect, like a more interior rather than uh, seeking for a purpose out of out of, out of your own self. I would like to, you to explain to me a bit more how important and how true is the transcendent aspect compared to the inner search, like the, yeah, I, mm. I hope I made that point. <laughs> By transcendency, I think you mean that, that seeking for, for a savior through the Buddha or something else? Yeah, like yeah, I mean in a, in a in divine sense, yeah. yeah. I think, uh, yeah, what you say is quite right, and it just points to the, the, the spectrum, I guess, the spectrum of belief. I mean, conventionally, you make a distinction between like, the popular or folk religion, and, you know, most studies in Buddhism have emphasized that, that there's the folk religion, and in that folk religion, the Buddha functions in many ways like a god does, okay? And then you have perhaps a deeper or more philosophical religion or the, the, the way of practice which is actually seeking within. And it's certainly true in Buddhism, as probably in all religions, that most uh, 
footage is most of it is, is based on those kind of external observances and things like that, even though the Buddha, like Jesus and like probably most of the other reformers, actually was saying, no, don't get involved in all of those external observances and things like that, but look inside yourself. But that's that that uh, that certainly becomes lost. Which is it's having said that, it still remains the case that even even so, even within the popular sphere of, of Buddhism, there are some different it's not quite correct to say that the Buddha is worshipped as God. Because if you were to ask even uh, popular or everyday Buddhists in somewhere like Thailand, they would still not think of the Buddha, for example, as a creator. Okay? So because the Buddha is not seen as a creator in that kind of sense. He may be seen as a saviour figure, so they may sort of bow down and pray to the Buddha to kind of save them and help them. But typically, what they would do is then kind of default to a more kind of animus position for getting what they want. Okay? So you, what you find is in, in the Buddhist countries, often they'll have like a Ganesh or they'll have a, a, a whatever it is, a Shiva or some kind of local god or Hindu god or something like that, who they'll propitiate for more kind of worldly concerns. Yeah? So Buddhism sort of exists in a complex sort of interrelationship with these kinds of, of things. So even within that cultural perspective, there is still some kind of idea, even if it's only an idea, even if it's not actually practiced, there's still some kind of idea that Buddhism is actually about that kind of inner search. Can I comment first? Please, sorry, mate. Uh, this is a very important question in that there's a fundamental problem in theology, that's transcendence, imminence. If we uh, aim for something that's purely transcendent, then what do we do now? How do I feel that transcendence? And this has led I think this is the fundamental difference between religions. Ultimately, all religions believe in something transcendent that you, you want to get to get there. And if you it's, take it's how we relate. In, the word, in the wrong way, it needs to work. You know what I mean? As well. well, let's not get into that. But uh, uh, I think, for example, Christianity deals with that problem by bringing God in the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus is here and now. And perhaps, if I take the, uh, if I may comment, even though Buddhism uh, idealizes that transcendence, uh, you can't escape the anthropomorphism, Buddha or others, because people have that need, inner need. Uh, this is uh, very risky, and perhaps Islam deals with that issue by not focusing on images, but the qualities and attributes of God that, uh, in a, uh, that we can, again, recognize and uh, see in the universe how it reflects and in, in our own self. And that enables us to get to know God and have relationship without... Um, it's a bit like the sun. The sun uh, is imminent in us through its heat and light, although it's distant. So we need to focus on the qualities and attributes. We become twisted in popular culture. There was one, this is a folk story from Thailand. They were, they were going out to fight the Burmese, as they uh, would do every so often. <coughs> and the, the great soldier was coming in here, he had like a sword in both hands, and he saw the opposing Burmese army, and he was rushing to do them. And to, as a safety protection, he would get, he got an amulet, a Buddha amulet, and put it in his mouth, right, and he was going to hold it in his mouth to protect him from the, the swords of the Burmese. I don't know how it's going to protect me because the Burmese had their own amulets, but I guess he thought the tiger ones were better. But anyway, <laughs> rushing, he trips over, he falls down on the ground, the amulet falls out of his mouth, the enemy's almost upon him, he scrapes around on the ground, finds it, puts it back in his mouth, and leaps to attack the enemy. When he does that, the amulet in his mouth comes alive with his energy, and it's like leaping around in his mouth, and he's convinced that the that suddenly, suddenly the Buddha has come alive for him, and he's filled with energy and, and vanquishes all of his decide all of his opponents kills them all. And at the end of it he realizes it was a little frog he put in there. <laughs> 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 so I just want to pick up one to the what you said about nature. That yeah, I think Nick, what nature really opposes is where transcendence um, combines with authority. So that there's a certain authority which tells you what the transcendent truth is and you submit to that. That's what he really rebels against. So in a way you can see his idea of the earth as, as the foundation or something as a, a different kind of transcendence. You know, it's going down rather than up, but it's still there's a, still a sense of, a, of some limits. You know, he talks about intellectual conscience that he thinks hardly exists, that people 
people don't think for themselves or really, you know, touch the earth. I mean, that's related. That's related to the Buddha as well, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Can I make a comment on that? For me, to connect, really, the point from there and there. Um, what Mehmet was talking about, um, imminence and transcendence, is what I was talking about in the reign of God and Jesus. Um, becoming human, God entering into humanity, is um, ushering in God's God's reign. In that's the imminent, but it's that it's the not yet. So the purpose, our purpose, then is to to continue that work, that ongoing work of of bringing about God's God's presence here. So there's the combination of the in, imminence and the transcendence. Um, and so in looking at um, this, uh, the, the times that we're living in, where we've got humanity who is capable of total destruction of the, of the planet, we're entering into times that are real challenges to the questions of life with um, how human life might be changed through technology. We've got um, <coughs> genetics and so on that's, that's you know, possible. We're, we're going to be faced with these questions of what is life and what is the purpose of life. And I think that um, the role of religion is going to be important in that. Yes. Perhaps Islam is one of the most misunderstood religions in that respect, the gender equality. But when you look at religious requirements, it's exactly the same for males and females. And and Quran is the only religious scripture or text that mentions specifically uh, women's rights over men, and men's rights over women. And that uh, when, when it talks about religious uh, reward for sanctions, it mentions men and women together. Uh, having said that, this, these fundamental questions when we're talking about uh, two words that may always occur in this in <coughs> uh, one is Islam sorry, uh, insan insan means human being without a gender <coughs> it's always human being is created <coughs> and then uh, another word is nafs that I have mentioned before and that has no gender either that we all have it, male and females um, and I recently read uh, this piece of work by a scholar where he was arguing that human soul has no gender either. Mm. That uh, human spirit mm. is no male or female. It's only our physical look and our remote, uh, hormones makes us male or female. Um, from um, Islam, there's a Christian perspective, no. Um, it's, uh, you know, if, when I spoke about you know, being in a time and, and a place, um, I think we're in a time where we recognise <coughs> that the scriptures were written through male eyes. And in this day and age, um, many people are reading the scripture through, through female eyes or through the eyes of the earth um, because uh, the times that they were written they were passed on through male eyes and so mm. there's a lot of um, change to come about through acknowledging and um, you know giving giving um, greater power to women I think um, a lot to be done there I go to a synagogue where the rabbi is a woman. The cantor who sings is also a woman. Um, that's because I belong to a progressive synagogue. Um, Orthodox synagogues would not have female rabbis. Um, and um, there is also, I think, an understanding in some respects a similar one to Islam in that men and women in Orthodox synagogues are separated. Um, Mostly it's because of the um, need to concentrate on prayer. 
and um, men apparently find it really difficult when women are around. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's also, in terms of ritual, uh, women have choice and men are obligated. So that's why it's, women are not, not allowed to do anything. They can do anything they like. Um, but they are not obligated because, it, in fact, in Judaism, women are considered to be slightly more spiritually um, superior than men. <laughs> no. And so men have to do these things when we can choose. <laughs> We're here, I guess, in part to look at the harm, uh, uh, try and bring harmony to a, a world that's broken in a lot of ways, and to our community, our Sydney community, our national community. And um, and I hear um, us talk, many of us talk of the importance of the inner journey and the inner responsibility, as opposed to I, uh, and this is my interpretation the superior organisation to which we might belong. This is my interpretation, whichever one it is. Um, as we see the corporate world not serving consumers, I see a parallel there too in this world not helping us in harmony. And I'm wondering what you'd say to my feeling that the hierarchy of all religions and uh, the corporate world, uh, society, is not helping at all in the harmony. Uh, it's the inner world we must all seek. And what is each religion doing about changing that, um, turning it upside down, perhaps? So the 20th century is a testimony to the destructiveness of not having religion at all. Uh, sometimes people say the religions cause wars, but in 20th century, none of the religions were dominant. So we're totally out of the picture. We had two world wars, 187 million people died. Uh, so we shouldn't forget that. Also, uh, I really think at, at the moment the whole world is quite dysfunctional because human beings are dysfunctional and then the families are dysfunctional, everything is breaking up. We have the highest rates of depression ever in history. Uh, so we need to come back to our humanity once again. I think we are so, in, in general, the people are too much, they're wasting their lives away. They're wasting the, the wonderful equipment and machinery given to us in spiritual terms. And, um, and we're not coming out of the soil of this earth into a spiritual realm. Um, for that reason, we are having the problems we are having now. So what we have to do is, we can't have a perfect world. It will never be there. But if enough of us realize our humanity and work for the goodness of the world and human beings, we can turn it around. Yeah. That wasn't quite my point, but that's right. Can I ask you to put that question as well? I, 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 would, I don't think it's as simple as, as, as you're presenting that you can, you can like dichotomize the hierarchy versus the individual mm -hmm. search. It's much more complex than that. Hierarchies sometimes do good things, maybe not all the time, mm -hmm. but sometimes they do it. And there's also a big problem with the inner search as well. It's not an entirely unproblematic thing. Uh, and they're not necessarily, they can be opposed to each other, but it can also be the case, and I think this is very much the case in modern Buddhism, where Buddhists are diverted from a consideration of, like if you think of the, the external or the, the relational aspect of spirituality, as opposed to the inner aspect, not as opposed to as complementing or contrasting. In many countries, and many times, we are actually seek our spirituality within, which which is at, at best, at best, it has 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 caused Buddhists to to neglect the proper application of their spirituality without. Okay, mm -hmm. and at worst, is 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 almost like a cynical, deliberate attempt to divert us from what is actually going on. And I cite as the most obvious example is the, the current conditions in Myanmar where there's a huge meditation movement in Myanmar. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people sitting there meditating every day. Are they spiritual? What's happening? Are they becoming spiritually awakened? And yet they're living in one of the most repressive regimes. I don't think we can ignore the connection between those things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <coughs> and so I think that, that there needs to be, certainly from a Buddhist point of view, one of the major things that we need to do is to, to reform the way that the external structures uh, of our religion are set up. 
just like the, the previous question about gender, and I think this is also probably true of the religions that spiritually there's no gender real problems, but the problems is with the institutions mm -hmm. and the hierarchy. So there needs to be a a, 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 a debating and a critique and a, a reformation of that. Um, I would just comment on that too where you're talking about uh, the hierarchy and the, the, the workers and, and the, the corporate world. Um, I think the corporate world is there for profit. That's their God. And, so, and, and to do with power. And so where you have a, 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 a disjunction between the so-called hierarchy or the, or the there has to be some sort of authority. There has to be some someone who has to hold things together. Where there's a disjunction, it's it's generally to do with power and um, an ego, and, and, corporate yeah, ego, yeah. Yeah. or hierarchy ego. Yeah. Yeah. A dogmatic faith, a dogmatic tradition, dogmatic religion. Well, there's going to be some taboo, intellectual taboo questions that you just won't touch, and that, and that leads to, I imagine, to one of these intellectual dishonesty. Basically, that, in other words, basically that um, these are intellectual. That if you if you don't have that faith, then you are just not going to touch those questions. Um, do you believe this is a problem for dramatic religions as well? Um, I I give you an example that many many years ago I used to be evangelical Christians, and. And I, one question I used to struggle with: Are homosexual sinners? Are they condemned by God? And it took me, quite frankly, going to a gay mic or to just and and talk and getting to know gay people to you know just realize well, they are just people and um, they are as probably as God I think the question is to me. Well, <laughs> what is this <laughs> 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 but not to him probably because I at least I he has a no problem with gays. No, <laughs> <laughs> at least it, as far as I understand, Buddhism it doesn't have a dogma. So you see, I think I think when okay, let me let me respond to that. Firstly, I have no problem with gay people. Um, and secondly, I do have a problem with dogma as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Islam is dogmatic. Uh, a faith tradition, a religion must propose something that you believe, you practice. Uh, actually, Islam has, has three dimensions. It's quite eloquently uh, summarized by the Prophet himself. There's the faith dimension, practices which is five pillars, and there's a spiritual dimension. Uh, that's probably the faith dimension you're referring to. <coughs> uh, again, this is the whole problem with our uh, Western worldview. We think that anything you believe is dogmatic. As I try to argue that uh, Islam is saying, look, I'm telling you not uh, to believe in this, not as a dogma, but as, a, as truth. This is really there. If you don't believe it, look at the universe around you. And, and you will find evidence for it. Now, if we can't find evidence for something that is proposed to be believed, then we need to believe it. And uh, in fact, one of the, the critique that the uh, Quran makes is people who believe without questioning. It says, why do you believe in what you believe? Uh, to the people of that time, uh, they say, we find our fathers believe in these things. He says, what if they were wrong? So Quran asks us to question what we believe because it's confident that its pr proposals are sound and true. Um, and again, I don't want to get into what they are, but um, personally, I went through that journey in my late teens. Uh, I did question my faith, and I have to say I was, I'm convinced rationally to prove that evidence that they're true. And it gives me a, a quite satisfaction that that's the case. And I ask this to uh, most Muslims, and that everyone goes through it. Uh, yes, there are Muslims who may not go through that and they believe in their religion dogmatically because they heard it from their fathers. Uh, we call that blind faith. And, um, and it's not the faith that God wants. Um, it's
is also uh, um, is, is very much about argument and debate and questioning, uh, constant questioning. And I was just remembering this little story about a man who goes to a rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I've become a, a non-believer. And the rabbi says, oh dear. He says, how, how long have you been studying the Talmud? He said, for 25 years. And the rabbi says, and already you're a disbeliever. <laughs> 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 and you know, the, there is there's so much that even though, yes, there is dogma, there's also an enormous amount of, of um, tradition and structure to try to, to continue the process of questioning. And uh, that's, that's a very good thing. Um, so that every community would have a different view. On, on those things. And this, this, you know, that's one of the things we need to start doing a bit more is to not, not even think so much about people as being a Jew or a Muslim or whatever it is, but people being people, people who are using a particular faith and so on to as a way of inquiry. And, and the differences within any religion are just as great or greater as the differences mm. between one religion and another. Mm. And I think just to add to that, um, I don't think it's useful to be too squeamish about the mm. fact that we identify ourselves with a particular religion. I think the thing is to <coughs> perhaps um, you know explore one's own tradition with the, in, with the with the great intention of so that your roots are very well established, perhaps, and your branches can go for as, as, as far as they can possibly go. I, I, don't, I don't sort of relish the idea of a homogenous society. I like, I like um, differences. And I think it would be a great loss if we all became the same for fear of difference. I just want to pick up on the word taboo. I think um, taboos go with myth. And we create myths to hide the victims. So in this case, the victims are the gay people. So our role is to bring the victims out into the light. Because as, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus became the innocent victim to reveal all victims. And um, that's what a culture of life is about. So wherever we have a situation that that brings about the death of someone or something, like, like what's going on with the planet at the moment, then we're not life-giving. And, and we're here to be life-giving and, con and contributors to life and not destroy life. Kenneth, look at suffering then. Mm -hmm. And so, it, in a sense, it's not a problem for Buddhism. But the interesting thing about Dukkha is there's one particular sutta of which uh, Buddhist scriptures where it says, suffering uh, gives rise to faith. <coughs> faith gives rise to joy. Yeah. Joy gives rise to gladness. Gladness gives rise to serenity. Serenity makes the mind concentrated and clear. And then you see things how they really are. When you see things how they really are, you can let go of them. Mm -hmm. And then you find true peace. Mm -hmm. But it all has to start with suffering. So if you don't suffer, it's a moment. If I may respond to that as well, uh, well, again, we need to look at the way we are created. Uh, we have powers, but they're not set, they're not limited. For instance, we have this power of anger. Uh, in, in the natural world, a lion goes, kills a zebra, but he doesn't do a serial killing of zebras in the savannah. <laughs> <laughs> but the human beings, we can have serial killers and you throw one bomb and kill 100,000 people. So our destructiveness is also immense uh, because we have no limits to our powers. Uh, also, it can go into the goodness as well. Uh, we are created that way because it, it, it uh, has immense, uh, infinite possibilities of human excellence as a result of that. If it was set, we would only go so far and that's it, we would stop. Like animals, you know, uh, a bee never says, uh, well, I'm sick of making honey, I want to get promoted. <laughs> become a higher you know, insect uh, in the food chain or something. Uh, but we, we always seek for something higher. 
so then we have freedom of choice. That uh, when God declared that he was going to create a human being, the angel's response was, are you going to create someone who will shed blood and cause mischief on earth? Uh, that they saw that distractiveness as well, and they couldn't understand why God would make that. But it is that freedom of choice also uh, uh, makes it valuable. You know, when we show an act of compassion, uh, it, it's so valuable and good. But a CAT scan is also, we cannot say a CAT scan is compassionate. It always uh, when it gives you the you know, symptoms of a disease or something. Uh, or a computer is a truthful computer. It always gives you the right answer. When it doesn't, you throw it away. But human beings, uh, we are truthful because we choose to be so. Um, Bishop Spong himself has also said he doesn't really believe in God. So, so therefore, what is God and why do religions sort of hang on to this concept of what? You know, does it make us better people? I don't know. I tell a story from the Bible. And then all of a sudden, people sort of begin to shrink into childhood memory of what God was once and badly taught or some kind of man with a beard that no longer exists or whatever it is. Because the word God comes with it. It, it comes very tainted, the word itself. If I say, if, when I'm teaching um, children about God, if you like, I'll often just replace it by higher purpose or greater good, something bigger than ourselves. But does there have to be something bigger than ourselves? Well, to I, have a I think that that's what, that's what it is that um, we speak, uh, you know, I can't speak for myself, I, I can only speak for myself. When I'm teaching religion, that's what I'm speaking of, something bigger than ourselves, even if it's ideal, or if it's something that um, goes beyond, it goes beyond me into, for me, I, I like the word mystery today. It may change you know, in a year or so, but mystery, I feel that there is a great mystery. I don't feel, and that mystery gives me, gives me, um, uh, sort of fills me. That's the best I can say in terms of God. Um, so it's not a being for me at, at all, and, and I think that whatever that sense of um, sort of something beyond oneself happens to be for that person, and it works for them, then so be that. We are limited by what we know of this universe. God is not in this universe. And that's why, uh, as Quran alludes us, we, things in this universe can only indicate God, something about God, but it will not fully tell us who God is. Um, and, and thirdly, Quran says that God is more real than what you think is real. It's just that your level of certainty is not there. And uh, you know, when I said earlier the purpose of life according to Islam is to find God, to get to know God and then worship God, uh, there's another uh, verse in Quran that says, worship God until you achieve Yaqeen. Yaqeen means certainty. Yeah, in Islamic spirituality there's seven levels of being you can elevate yourself to. And as you go through these seven levels of being, uh, your level of certainty also de increases. Uh, at the bottom you have blind faith. As I said, blind faith is nothing. It's not uh, valuable. Above that you have certainty of knowledge. Imagine there's fire outside of this building and people tell us, everybody quick get out, there's fire. And then we hear this from independent sources, that's certainty by knowledge. And then if we get out to see it, we, it's certainty by seeing. We no longer need information, we're seeing it already. And then if you're not really sure that there's fire, go dipping your hand into it, and then you'll have a certainty of feeling. You can close your eyes, you'll know fire is there. So uh, the ultimate goal in Islamic spirituality is to feel God to, to absolute certainty. My feeling on that is that with the Abrahamic religions, that there's always this kind of, that's what I'm hearing tonight, and also what from the scriptures themselves is that there's a kind of uh, a wrestling, if you like. I mean, I really like this, this thing of, where was it, was it Abraham or something? Yeah. Jacob was wrestling with a stranger all night and then gets up in the morning and then finds out he's God. You know, this is a kind of a fantastic mm -hmm. image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An angel. Yeah. An angel. Yeah. An angel. Yeah. 